All right, sweet. So, like Desmond said, my name's Ryan. I work at Dollar Shave Club. We'll just nip this in the bud. We sell beard oil. I use it. There we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, also, I had delusions of grandeur that I'd be walking around the stage like very Steve Jobs-esque, so I checked out this clicker with a laser pointer from IT. So, I'm gonna stand away from the laptop. I'm gonna try to use it. If I move over here, just check me and I'll scoot on back. I'll do my best. All right. So, uh, for those of you who already read what is apparently my entire abstract on the website, uh, you've already heard 40 minutes of me talking. So, I'm gonna try to add a little bit to it if I can. Uh, we're gonna pare down the title as well. Um, I like puns. We're all engineers here. Uh, in addition to being engineers, we're learners, and we love puns. And so the first time I heard somebody mention Kafka to me, I was like, Franz? And they're like, Apache. And so I was like, metamorphosis? They're like, huh? And I was like, all right, we're changing messages. Got it. We do transformations in a pipeline. And so from the next 30-ish eh, minutes or so, when I say Kafka, you can think message queue. You don't have to think streaming pub sub append only immutable commit log. You can just say queue and we're good, that's fine. Um, anytime I use Kafka, you can think SQS, you can think RabbitMQ, whatever. In fact, once we get to like the five, 10 minute mark, we're probably not gonna mention it again. All right, so let's get to it. Let's talk about these three things, three of my favorite tools. So as an engineer, like I said, I'm a learner. And one thing that's really important to me is I get the opportunity to learn new things at work. Everything I do is about using the current activity to write the instruction manual for all future instances of that activity, right? Everything that we do is an opportunity to learn how to learn. And so everything that we're gonna talk about today is really gonna tie in how do we learn tools like GenStage, Kafka, and Elixir itself. If we are a community that's actively trying to grow, which is something I've, this is only my third time around other Elixir developers, actually fourth if you include last night's dinner. And one of the themes that I've seen over and over and over again is the emphasis and the importance of growing this community. And it's kind of like watching The Wire. If you've seen The Wire, great. If you've seen The Wire, you've probably told everyone you know that you've seen The Wire. And at least half of them said, ah, oh, the first episode was a little slow. And then you're like, what? Okay. So we can't evangelize Elixir the same way we would The Wire because there's a barrier to entry. Someone has to learn a new language, a new paradigm, a new mental model. So how do we map those mental models to our peers, to our friends, to our coworkers, our managers, our stakeholders? How do we communicate the power and flexibility of the platform that we're using so that they can buy in, they can adopt it, and they can continue spreading that for us? So today, we're gonna talk about how we use Kafka, Elixir, GenStage, how we handle our transactional messaging pipeline, but ultimately, how do we turn this into a meaningful learning exercise, both for ourselves and for the people around us. All right, so let's, let's do a little schedule check-in. So, GenStage, why? Why do we care about GenStage at all? Then we're gonna talk about the Transactional Messaging Service, aptly named, really creative, one of our best. Um, and so we'll call it TMS. And then we'll get into the bottleneck. Why does this pipeline not function the way the overlords of Elixir have told us it would? And of course, how do we tune GenStage? How do we solve the problem of the bottleneck? And finally, what comes next? What are we gonna do after we've solved these problems? And of course, solving one problem as an engineer is only a temporary fix, right? We strive for a state of continuous improvement, but ultimately, it's only temporary, right? Just marred by failure, in turn, solving a problem, we come back to it. So, real quick, let's do a couple, I guess we can try the shows of hands, I can see people. So I know everyone here is pretty much using Elixir in production already. Who here has used GenStage in production? Obviously some of our prior speakers have. Okay, so a few hands. Okay, great. Who here has thought about using GenStage in production? A few more hands, okay. Who here hit the GenStage hex docs, saw the counter example, implemented it, got a bunch of integers growing in the IEX shell, and they said, all right, now what? Anyone? Okay, so how do we get from I can print numbers to a screen that with a bunch of modules communicating to I send thousands of messages per minute in a meaningful way at work? All right, so that's where we're gonna start is how do we get started with GenStage? And so this is something that has kind of a personal journey for me as well. The first time I was asked if I would be interested in taking a ticket on the Elixir service, our transactional messaging service, 
my coworker said, hey, you want to take a ticket on this? I said, yeah, absolutely. What is it? He's like, it's a functional programming language. Are you interested? I was like, well, I have math background. And right now I'm writing Rails code, so not a lot of math there. Let's go functional. Let's try this. Do one ticket. And he says, all right, you're going to take it over. I'm leaving. Have fun. <laughs> and I was like, all right. He's like, so first thing you want to look up is Gen Stage. Check out this cool website. It's called Elixir School. And they have a great section on it. I said, all right, let's go. So what do you think I find when I find Gen Stage on Elixir School? The counter example. And I'm like, all right, I get it. There's a pipeline here. We're, we're putting a mental model together. And we kind of get that going. And I'm like, all right, so now what? He's like, well, now we hook this up to Kafka. Now we consume a couple hundred thousand messages a day. And then we're going to send them to an email service provider. And in the middle of that, we're going to have some metaprogramming. We're going to have some stages. And we're going to decouple the architecture from the main monolith. It's going to be awesome. I'm like, from a counter. OK, that's fine. We can do that. So let's get into Gen Stage and let's talk about what are the basics that we have to learn here. By the way, if anyone has ever made a better diagram, feel free to step forward at any time. But this is, a, <laughs> this is once in a lifetime artwork, people. So just, just treasure this moment. So why do we take a whole slide just for vocabulary? Well, my learning journey is about life-changing moments. And for me in high school, I had a calculus teacher who got angry at us one day. And she said, if you master the vocabulary of a subject, you'll have power over the material. And for me, I thought about all the hobbies that I have. I played basketball, I played tennis, did a bunch of things. But every single one of those activities had a shared vernacular, where I could immediately recognize someone else who had that same shared experience, who was seeking that same shared experience. And when I embraced the language of that activity, I'm saying yes to knowledge. I'm saying yes to learning. And I'm welcoming that into my mind. And so when we take a moment and we ground ourselves in the core vernacular of a topic, we're ready to learn it. And we're ready to implement it in a new way. So let's talk about what makes Gen Stage. So obviously, some people here are advanced Gen Stage practitioners. And for you, maybe this is something that you can share with other people who are interested in learning about it for the first time. But if you are learning about it for the first time, let's take a walk. Or not a walk, but a point. All right. Oh, sorry. I hope I didn't just laser somebody. All right, so producers. So let's take a look at the pipeline here. At the top, we have P for producer. In the middle here, we have PC for producer consumer, and we have C for consumer. All right, so let's talk about what all this means. So Gen Stage is a multi-stage event processing pipeline. Now, we're already working in Elixir here, and so we're all into pipelines. So what is the purpose of a pipeline? Input, output. What we're doing is we're adding multiple stages to a pipeline. And if you think about it like a freeway, what do we also have? On-ramps and off-ramps. And a lot of those off-ramps from our pipelines, what kind of activities might characterize those off-ramps? HTTP requests, database queries, our favorite things, side effects. Right? And so that's how we break out of the pipeline. So the, the visual model that we create in building GenStage from scratch mirrors our own mental model of a pure function, the language in which we're working right now. So by the way, shouts to Jose, right? Coming up with something like this that just fits perfectly into the paradigm of the other thing he created. Maybe it's surprising, but probably not, having seen his talks now. So, so what happens? We obviously have input and output from the pipeline. So we start at the beginning, the producer. So as it turns out, the producer itself may be receiving data from somewhere else. It may not be a true producer in the global, outside the system sense. But as far as the rest of Gen Stage is concerned, this is the beginning. We produce events from here. And as it produces events, it's obviously going to send those events downstream to other stages in the pipeline. And so what are the requirements of Gen Stage? What are the primitives here? So we have to have a producer, and we have to have a consumer. Right? Also known as a sync. In the middle, though, we have the producer-consumer. The only rule for gen stage is that we have to have zero or more producer-consumers. There's no limit to how many we can have as long as our compute resources can handle it. So a producer-consumer, don't overthink it, it does both. Right? It consumes, and shocker, it produces. So how does this work, though? If we have producers, we have producer-consumers, we have consumers, and we think about something like Kafka or RabbitMQ, or any sort of pub sub system. Or we think about the world I came from. Everyone's favorite here, Node, mm -hmm. right? We have event emitters. 
where we subscribe to events. We listen for something to happen, and when that happens, some action is automatically taken. Now, that's great, but what if, what if this nondescript circle called the PC, what if it can't handle a massive stream of events? Or what if down here, a consumer can only handle one event per hour for some reason? Well, that's gonna cause a major problem, and that's gonna be a bottleneck. And as we all move towards programming and distributed systems, bottlenecks are one of our primary constraints. And as we move towards distributed systems and we start thinking in terms of the law of constraints, we can actually think about our code, our event pipelines, as a manufacturing plan. If you've read the Phoenix Project, you can start immediately applying lean manufacturing principles to an inanimate system. But what's special here is that as these events, E, are moving down the pipeline, what if something's not ready for them? Well, Jose thought about this and he said, hey, you know what, what if the system itself wasn't predicated upon the producer just shoveling events down every other stage's throat? What if instead, the bottom of the pipeline, the consumers, were driving the system? Hmm, how might that work? Well, as it turns out, it's very straightforward, and this is what we call a demand-driven system. And this is where we get the term back pressure. So if you're already familiar with back pressure, great. If you're not, that's okay. So what happens here is that this system doesn't start here. In fact, it starts here with the consumers. When the consumers are brought online, when the process is spawned, they say, hey, I'm ready for some number of events. And as it turns out, we can configure that number of events with max demand in gen stage. And so the consumer will tell the next stage upstream, I am ready for max demand number of events. They'll send a request or demand. And of course, since we all work in Elixir and we've all worked with gen servers probably, we know that we have to handle this demand. So we handle demand. And the PC says, all right, I've gotten some requests for demand. I don't have anything yet because I just came online myself. Where can I get some events? Well, turns out we have a producer up here. So we go up to the producer and we say, all right, I'm gonna demand some events from the producer. And so the producer will do whatever it needs to do to start shoveling events into this pipeline and fulfill the max demand. Now, that's the high level overview. Once we begin this process, now we can start tuning. And we're gonna, we're gonna get to that once we get to a real system, an implementation of gen stage. So we have producers, producer consumers, consumers, events, we have demand, and we have back pressure. But what's not here? The dispatchers, because really, we're not limited to one producer consumer in this stage. We can have an unlimited number of them in theory. And in turn, we can do the same thing with consumers. So how do we determine how events are routed out? Apache Kafka has a robust system for determining how events are routed to topics, partitions, and in turn, consumer groups and the consumers that live within them. Gen stage can implement something similar with different methods of dispatching. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit later when we get to the tuning section. So, let's keep it going. All right, so, now let's make it even simpler. Let's, we're almost to the counter now, right? So let's say we just have a producer and we have a consumer. And so why do we break it down in this way? Why do we care about this flow? And so, if we're building a mental model of a system that's in flow at all times, I liken this to the same way that we teach JavaScript or we teach Node. In JavaScript, the concern is the call stack. It's single-threaded, the interpreter is synchronous and blocking, right? We can't go through one step until we finish the current one, and there's one call stack, and that's it. And so we're always concerned with what's on top of the call stack. Elixir is concurrent by default. That is its pride and joy. And so it's not the call stack that we're as concerned with. Instead, we are concerned with processes and the messages we send between them. So, in this case, we're gonna limit ourselves to just two processes, a producer and a consumer. And so let's go through the actual flow. Let's walk through it step by step. Because ultimately, no matter how complicated a gen stage pipeline is, this flow is the foundation of it. So first things first, the consumer is gonna send demand to the producer. The producer, its handle demand function is invoked. The producer is now gonna send the maximum demand to the consumer. The consumer will process some number of events. Eventually, its remaining number of events will equal an attribute set on that module called 
the minimum demand, at which point it says, hey, I'm ready for some more events. And so what does it do? It sends demand back to the producer. So no matter how complicated your gen stage pipeline is, no matter how many consumer producers you have, no matter how many consumers you have, ultimately this is the flow from one stage to the stage above it. Dispatch, tuning, restart strategies, supervision or life cycles, as Bruce eloquently put it earlier, these are all ways to tune gen stage. But ultimately this flow, if we can articulate this flow in a complex system at all times, not only can we learn gen stage, we can implement it in meaningful ways without having to necessarily implement MapReduce from scratch, which, by the way, is one of the core implementations of Flow. Jose's talk when he introduced Flow for the first time basically implemented a rudimentary MapReduce by counting the words in a string, or counting the frequencies of the words in a string. Okay, oh, that felt good. It's, I don't know why I'm pointing back there. It's not doing anything. All right, so now, how do we expand the mental model just a tad bit further, or maybe not expand it, but maybe merge two mental models. So there are two here at play. There's Kafka, which you can really substitute any message queue in its system, and then we have GenStage. Notice the overlapping vocabulary here, right? Producers begin the pipeline in GenStage. They're not writing to a log necessarily. Well, they don't have to, they could be, but they are producing events and producers in a Kafka cluster are writing to a topic. They are producing events that are committed to a log. Gen stage, we have producer consumer. These are optional. The brokers in Kafka are not optional, but they can, not always, they can serve a similar function. The producer consumers can be used to route messages directly to different kinds of consumers. They can be moved to different pipelines, and they can serve a function akin to, but not the same as a broker. And then consumers, and consumers have a really, really similar function beyond just the fact that they represent sinks. A consumer in a gen stage pipeline, we think of it as the end of the road. If we go back to the previous slide, that's it, right? There is, because there's no more gen stage. But that's not the end of the events life cycle, right? At the end of this, at the end of consumption is where we begin things like post requests where we complete the cycle or we persist something into a database, or we might rewrite it to a new log, or we might send it to Elasticsearch for processing later. Kafka's the same way. A Kafka consumer can publish to a new topic, write to a database, send another HTTP request, begin an RPC call, any number of things. So while consumers represent the end of one component of a pipeline, they don't have to represent the end of the, your system-wide pipeline. And that's what's really important to keep in mind here. And then finally, we have dispatchers and supervisors. Now again, supervisors, I really do love what Bruce said earlier about life cycle management. Because ultimately, the supervisors here, especially as we're going to get into our implementation of using consumer supervisors later, spoiler alert, manage the life cycles of processes that you may or may not have explicitly spun up yourself. Zookeeper is not solely responsible for that. Zookeeper is responsible for broker metadata and making sure that the cluster itself stays healthy and handling the fault tolerance and replication in Kafka. And in that way, they're both tied to each other. And so if your mental model is already geared around Elixir being a pipeline and it's geared around GenStage being a pipeline, it's only logical to extend it with an event queuing system that brings events into that process. And so if you've never worked with these systems before, that's okay. You can build one mental model for yourself and start assembling them piecemeal and moving forward from there with small but meaningful implementations of these processes that will yield shocking amounts of power. And that's really what this comes to, is that gen stage on its own, when you reach documentation, you come back to the counter example, which I'm gonna keep coming back to over and over and over again. It's amazing because you can implement it and you can see real work being done in front of you. It's like the first time you cook in a kitchen and you eat the food and you're like, oh, this is awful, but I made it and it's great. And so then you get gen stage running, you're like, start link, start link, subscribe, event, 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 oh my God, this is amazing. And then you're like, now what? Right, because the first time you made a Philly cheesesteak in your kitchen and you overcooked the ribeye because you put it in for 10 seconds, you're like, well, now how am I gonna sous vide a filet? I don't know. You look it up and you try it and you see what happens. And that's the same thing that we have to do with GenStage, is that we have to find meaningful implementations because it's flexibility and power 
is such that it can be overwhelming. It's like, I hate to out myself like this, it's like having an Android phone. I have an iPhone, I could never have an Android because the sheer volume of customization available to me is, is overwhelming and I would just quit right then. And so I have to have some of that done for me. But GenStage is one of those tools where it's, it's a low level abstraction to the system and because it's so powerful and flexible, it's easy to just say, well, I'm not at scale to require this. It's not about requiring, it's about can you make use of it? Can you improve the quality of your systems by using a system of this nature? So, let's get into the pipeline. What are we doing at Dollar Shave Club with GenStage? So here, here, here it is. So we have our e-commerce platform, we have Kafka, we have TMS, and we have an ESP, an email service provider. So let's talk about what the transactional messaging service does real quick. So if you were to go to dollarshaveclub.com today, and let's say you were to check out. Let's say you do not have a plan, and you say, you know what, I just wanna buy some stuff. I want some razors, I wanna try it out. I'm not gonna sign up, I'm just gonna do this. Boom, you sign up, and of course you get a confirmation email with all the products you just purchased, your shipping address, hopefully a correctly calculated subtotal, maybe a correctly calculated total, some sales tax, and maybe like your name and like your email address was used correctly. Okay, great. How did that happen? You're looking at it. So we have a Rails monolith. The Rails monolith will trigger, of course, a sidekick job. I feel like a lot of people here are familiar with sidekick. And we're gonna build that message. Then we publish it to Kafka, and eventually the TMS will consume it. It'll consume it, repackage it in a way that our email service provider is expecting, which by the way is a very, very specific way. And then we send, hopefully, which we'll come back to. <laughs> so the pipeline itself is simple. And on its face, yeah, Kafka seems like overkill. Any queuing service would do here, right? RabbitMQ, SQS, and maybe any email service would do. SES, um, certainly, you know, anything from SES all the way up to Salesforce. If it can send email, we're good. MailChimp, right? Uh, MailChimp, yes, okay. Great, so that's the pipeline. It's really straightforward on its face. And the setup, is it the same? Okay, there we go. But now let's let's drop the e let's drop the e-commerce platform, and let's go a little bit further. So if we take a look at this, what do we have? We have the queue again. Kafka is interchangeable here. We don't really care about that. Then we have the Kafka consumer, which, as it turns out, is the Gen Stage producer. Now, if you're wondering, like, well, why don't you use Broadway? This this implementation predates Broadway, and we're going to circle back to Broadway and Flow later. But we have our Kafka consumer slash gen stage producer, and that begins the flow of events into the transactional messaging service. And then we go straight to a gen stage consumer. That's it, right? This is a production application using gen stage in what seems like a really simple way. The barrier to entry is not nearly as high as we once thought, which is great. So then we send to our ESP. So cool. We have a nice little distributed system. We got all the common pieces. We got a slow monolith, super powerful event queue, and we got an event processing pipeline in a super powerful language designed for concurrency and fault tolerance. Well, how are we using it? <sighs> all right, this is the moment. <laughs> so if you're working in distributed systems, you have to identify your constraints. You have to identify bottlenecks in the system. As it turns out, we have a bottleneck. The bottleneck is right here. Our little friend, the ESP. Despite being an enterprise grade application, since our application was started, let's say we were sending a couple hundred thousand messages a day. Well, out of those couple hundred thousand, we could expect half a percent to one percent of them to get no response from the ESP. None. Not an error, not a crash, just nothing. Okay, so what do we do here? Well, we talk to support. And the ask was, can you increase the timeout limits? Sure, what do you need? Two minutes. Yeah. No, no, take, take your time. Take two minutes if you need to. We, no problem. So once we, we set our timeout limits to two minutes, we said, all right, let's see how this works. And of course, still not really helping. All right, so why is that? Why are we still stuck here? And I said, well, maybe there's another bottleneck. There are auth tokens that have to be embedded in these post requests. And of course, those have to be fetched from another endpoint from the same ESP. They have to be refreshed regularly. 
I wonder if that's a bottleneck. Let's put some metrics around that. And of course, every time we have a period of high throughput, no response, occasionally. And because it's occasional, we can't really identify if messages are going through. And transactional messages, while they do have a legal obligation to get there, we do live in uh, almost abject fear that they get delivered three, four, five to 10 times. We really don't want them delivered repeatedly. Has anyone ever received 15 order confirmation emails from Amazon? I have not. I would not be thrilled if I did. So what do we do? We're stuck without valid retry logic. And we don't really know what's happening to almost 1% of the messages that we send. How can we solve this problem? I mean, this is what we do as engineers, right? We build something, new problem arises. All right, solve new problem. Input, output. Of course, this is not a pure function, right? Given the same problem over and over, our output will be different, hopefully. And that's why we ingest knowledge as a second argument to that function. So what did we do? What could we come up with in order to figure this out? Well, as it turns out, we were working with extremely imperfect information from our ESP. Not until two weeks ago did I find out that at 1,000 requests per minute, they throttle you. They don't rate limit you, they throttle you. And they reduce the resources allocated to the endpoint uh, until traffic dies down. So we have been operating without knowing that for a couple of years and probably flooding this endpoint. So let's talk a little bit more about what the actual architecture is here. So we see this pipeline, but it's actually a little bit bigger than this. So the queue is here. But this Kafka consumer gen stage producer, there are actually 10 of them deployed in Kubernetes. <laughs> so when we're overloading that endpoint, so we batch our shipments. Our fulfillment pipeline batches shipments in roughly a low five-figure sum, and pretty much every hour for 13 to 14 hours a day. And so during these periods of 10 to 20,000 messages sent over a span of two to three minutes, you might imagine this endpoint doesn't hold up too well especially when you have 10 different instances of the application doing it all at once. Again, really no idea why for the longest time. So once we realize we have a flow problem, right? We're using a demand-driven pipeline, but we're overflowing a downstream bottleneck with events. We're, we're living in clear violation of the stated purpose of gen stage. So how do we get through that? Well, when there's a problem to be solved, you call the Ghostbusters. No. When there is a problem to be solved, you have to look at your, your toolbox, right? When I think about calculus, especially integral calculus, I always think about the list of integrals that are available to me when I'm going to solve a problem. It doesn't really matter if you know any of them, but you know that if you look at a problem, visual cues tell you, like, oh, do I want U substitution? Do I want integration by parts? Do I want partial fraction decomposition? Do I want a trigonometric integral, an inverse trigonometric integral? Who knows? But ultimately, the best you can do is look at the visual cues available to you, pick the tool that you think is the best one for the job, and start using that tool. It's entirely possible that is the right tool for the job. It's also entirely possible that it's the wrong tool for the job. And you'll get five, six, seven steps in, and you're like, well, all right, back to the toolbox. And so what do you do? You pick up where you left off, and you start iterating through the list of available tools. It's not a sexy algorithm, but it's an algorithm nonetheless. And so, when we have a problem with gen stage, and it's about flow, reliability, so concurrency and fault tolerance, the key benefits that we get for free with Elixir, what tools do we have available to us? And so we visit the gen stage docs. So what are the things that we can tinker with in gen stage? So dispatching, demand, partitioning consumers, and then we can manipulate supervision. Now the supervision in this case on its face is not part of gen stage, right? The supervisor module and dynamic supervisors are not part of gen stage. But if we were to look at supervision, because obviously we have requests that are timing out, processes may not be crashing, but we're losing messages. Why are we losing messages? And we do have some processes crashing, but not all of them. And so supervision strategy is definitely something we want to investigate. So the issue here is that if we only have one consumer, from our gen stage pipeline, and we have one gen stage producer, and we know that we send batches of events to the gen stage consumer. If one of these request timeouts were to crash the consumer, we'll lose all the events in memory in the gen stage consumer. So that's not really a fault tolerant or sustainable way to architect that pipeline. 
there has to be a better way to isolate a highly error-prone process. As it turns out, dynamic supervision and dispatching have a friend. And that friend's name is the consumer supervisor. So the consumer supervisor is part of GenStage. And it is basically what happens when a dynamic supervisor and a GenStage consumer say, hmm, I think we can learn something from each other here. And so a consumer supervisor can subscribe directly to a producer or producer consumer. The consumer supervisor is inserted into the pipeline as a consumer. End of story. It subscribes to a producer or a consumer producer in just the same way. You give it the same start link arguments, and off you go. But what it does differently is that for every event received, instead of processing it like an enum or a stream or a queue, it spawns a process per event. Now we're using Elixir's concurrency to our advantage. Now we're creating concurrency and fault tolerance by changing our consumer from a consumer to a consumer supervisor. So now, if one of these HTTP requests times out, that's fine, because every event in the batch can be processing concurrently, and so if one of them times out, now we're closer to having retry logic, and now we're protecting the integrity of the rest of the events in the pipeline. Okay, so that's part one. But what else can we do with the consumer supervisor? How do we set that up? So first things first, max and min demand. This is the tricky part. So with a gen stage consumer, the maximum demand is how many events it will receive in its first batch upon coming online and requesting events from a producer for the first time. But after it processes some of those events, eventually its number of events remaining <coughs> will come down to its minimum demand level. When minimum demand is reached, it sends a request, a demand notification upstream. So how do minimum and maximum demand work when our consumer is not a consumer, it's a supervisor? Well, as it turns out, the maximum and minimum demand are the number of workers that the consumer supervisor is willing to spawn. So if I set my maximum demand at 20, the consumer supervisor will request 20 events from a producer, the producer will send 20 events, and the consumer supervisor will spawn 20 processes, one event per process. Now, 20 processes, that seems fine, right? We're on the beam. What about tens of thousands of processes? We should be good here, right? Well, now knowing that I can only send 1,000 requests per minute to this endpoint, I'm glad I did not try to spin up 1,000 processes. That would have ended really poorly in a hurry. So what's really important to know is that when these child processes are spawned, they will work to completion. When the task is completed, they terminate. And the termination of the child process is the signal of acknowledgement back to the consumer supervisor that the event has been completed. And when the number of terminations is equal, or sorry, when the original max demand request minus the number of event term, or child process terminations received by the consumer supervisor is equal to the minimum demand, that's when the consumer supervisor will now request more events from the producer. Okay. So this is the real setup now. So we don't have one consumer. Instead, we have one producer, right, because we are deployed in 10 instances. And so we just have the one Kafka consumer per instance. And that Kafka consumer is our gen stage producer. And it is going to send events to the consumer supervisor. The consumer supervisor will receive a batch of events. Now, as it turns out, my max demand is higher than five. I just felt like five was an appropriate number to put on the slide, but really we could just do the whole thing and it could be like 10 slides wide. So right now we have it set to 20. But we're gonna circle back to that. Um, but this is what it looks like now. And so what happens is as each process is spawned, we now don't really have to worry about one failure, one timeout, one lack of a response causing a loss of any events. So we have an, introduced a real level of fault tolerance here. But unfortunately, at this point, we still don't know why we don't get a response. And as long as we don't know why we don't get a response, we can't confirm that the message has been sent to anyone. And so as long as we can't confirm the message has been sent, we can't retry them still. And so we're still losing some, we're just losing fewer because now we're leveraging GenStage's concurrency model a little bit better. Okay, so we got to this point, but now what? 
So we can lose fewer messages, and we can make progress with this, but ultimately, we're still kind of stuck on this overkill architecture, right? And so first things first, 10 instances is excessive, right? We, because we can send more than 20 requests at a time. As it stands now, we're sending two requ or 200 requests per batch, but over 10 instances. And so first things first, based on the research that we've compiled for this talk, the obvious answer here is we can chop down the number of replicas probably by half to start, and honestly probably down to two or three. And of course, we will, that'll be inversely proportional to the consumer supervisor worker count. And in this time, the next thing we do is we're gonna implement new retry logic. How do we do that? Well, now that we know the source of the lack of responses from the ESP, we can publish to a failed messages topic. And those can be reprocessed in a new gen stage pipeline that'll have a new Kafka consumer and a new gen stage producer. And those can be published, and they, they can follow a similar method with the same consumer supervisor. And this will allow us to retry messages safely at a time when we'll reduce the thundering herd effect and we'll have some nice back off. Okay, but the really exciting part here is that as we scale down the number of nodes, we increase the worker counts on the consumer supervisors, we increase the replication inside of gen stage, and we leverage that concurrency and fault tolerance a little bit better we're still one key element short. There's one more part that we really wanna focus on, and that's following Jose's mental map from all of the presentations where we talk about Elixir is eager, and then it is lazy, and then it is concurrent, and then it is distributed. And to truly run as a distributed system, we need multiple nodes or instances of an application or a service acting as one. And right now, we don't have that. We have multiple instances of a service acting as multiple parallel instances of a service. So I just have concurrency squared, which isn't really giving us the benefits of real distributed Elixir. And so, what can we do? We can bring in a library like libcluster, or we can bring a library in like Horde. And once we bring those in, we can implement a service registry, or sorry, a process registry, and then we can bring in uh, some CRDTs, and now we can start keeping track of state, and when we bounce pods and we do a new deployment, we can actually reduce pretty much message loss inflow to zero. So that's really exciting, and that's what's gonna be coming up next for the service. Uh, big one, though, really exciting, is Broadway's out. It's been out for a little bit, um, but as the lone Elixir developer at work, um, and I also am tasked on other projects, I don't get to, uh, to play in my sandbox as often as I would like. But in researching this talk and kind of digging into flow and digging into Broadway, Broadway is a great fit for what we have. And so I'm really looking forward to implementing Broadway in the service and kind of getting that going. And finally, this is where the challenges really begin, is where we can expand GenStage. And now that we have a real meaningful example of it working, albeit simple, but a meaningful example of it working in production, we can do something else. And we're really fortunate that we're having this at a time where our corporate architecture is changing dramatically. As we move to a service-oriented architecture, or really a microservice architecture, we're going to have new upstream producers from Kafka. And so while we only have one transactional email topic, we're now going to have multiple producers writing to that topic. And these producers may not have all of the data in their persistent data stores that are required to build some of the emails. And so our service will now consume from other topics, read messages, store them in memory, queue them, and now we're going to have to join, or get to, really, join messages. And so that's where Horde is really gonna come into play. Is that as we bring in additional, uh, additional upstream applications, uh, we'll be able to read topics, consume other topics, merge those messages together, and leverage GenStage in a more appropriate way. And so what are some of the tools that we can use for that? Well, first things first, dispatching. So right now we are using what's called the broadcast dispatcher. The broadcast dispatcher says, all right, producer, you're only going to send events to your downstream consumers when all of them have sent you a demand notification. Well, as you may have noticed, we just have the one consumer supervisor right now. So in order for this to become meaningful, we're gonna want multiple gen stage pipelines. And as we spawn multiple consumer supervisors, 
now we can use broadcast dispatching to not only wait for all of the consumer supervisors to have demand, but then use selector functions, basically a callback function that you would pass to filter that has to return a truthy or falsy value. And we can now partition messages in the event pipeline to the consumers of our choice. And so we have actually a special use case for this. Okay, everyone here has used Amazon, yes? Cool. Awesome, great. So if you've added something to your cart, you've probably added something to your cart, taken it back out of your cart, left it in your cart, come back to it two days later, taken three more things out, put them back in, and then purchased. We have an email that says if you add something to your cart, we're gonna let you know, like, hey, you just added this to your cart because you're gonna be getting it on a monthly basis. But there's a really high probability that if you, um, if you add something to your cart, you're probably gonna do it a few more times. So it's probably best that we don't send you an email for every single one of those. It seems excessive. So I wonder if there's a way to batch those. Well, absolutely there is. And this is where broadcast dispatching and the selector functions come into play. With a broadcast dispatcher, we can now route to a producer consumer that batches emails by, let's say, some sort of customer identifier, like a UUID or a customer ID, and a message key, and we'll batch emails for a certain amount of time. We can persist a timer, and as the timer dwindles down, if a new message comes in for that particular batch, we'll reset the timer. If not, when the timer dwindles down to zero, off we go. Now, the obvious issue here is what happened to the distributed elixir? What happened to multiple nodes? And that's where Horde comes back into play. And as it turns out, we have a celebrity in the audience. Somebody has already thought of this. The person who introduced me to the transactional messaging service, Shirag, is sitting back there. And he has written a super handy blog post about implementing Horde and distributed Elixir for this exact purpose. I encourage you all to check it out. It's really fascinating. And so finally, that is how we're going to bring in new upstream producers. We're going to partition the pipeline. And we're going to leverage both distributed Elixir, concurrent Elixir, to get all of the concurrency and fault tolerance that we really deserve from a transactional messaging pipeline. And then what's really exciting is that eventually there will be a new ESP. And from what my market research has told me, standard throughput is about 2,000 requests per second. So there will be no more of the two minute timeouts waiting for the occasional message to just vanish. Okay, so real quick, I just wanna thank the community here. This is, um, this is a real special day for me because again, this is only the fourth time now I've been around other Elixir developers. and being around a community of this nature that is so focused on learning has been, uh, it's the experience that I always look for when I have the opportunity to pick up a new subject. And learning Elixir has definitely been one of those experiences for me, where learning Elixir has made me better at learning other things. I know I've seen blog posts floating around the internet where someone says, learning Elixir made me a better programmer. It made me a better web developer. It made me a better distributed systems thinker. And for me, Elixir has made me a better learner. This is a declarative language, and that is, that is endemic to functional programming, of course. But in turn, a lot, of our, a lot of our documentation is fairly declarative as well. And so is a lot of the guidance we give each other. But that doesn't mean that declarative guidance and declarative documentation lacks meaning or lacks empathy. And what I've noticed is that the, Jose sets the tone of just being in there and helping other people grow. And for him to share that knowledge and allow other people to develop true expertise in a language that's growing at this rate is phenomenal. And so I hope that through this a small, meaningful example of a really powerful tool, we can take the next step and start sharing that knowledge with others through a good pedagogy, a formal vocabulary, and building meaningful examples in real life where we can solve business problems and show that this is, this is a great way to do things. And it's a great community to be a part of. And finally, I gotta thank my man, Chirag, because I would not have ever touched Elixir or heard of it if it weren't for him. And he handed off the service to me and he's here today, and uh, I just wanna give him a huge round of applause. This is a, uh, thank you, man, appreciate it. And to Desmond, because Desmond, uh, Desmond offered to meet me for lunch and uh, talk to me about my talk. And uh, real quickly, he was like, 10 Kubernetes instances, huh? Seems a little overkill. I was like, yeah, I'll look into that. As it turns out, my man, it is. <laughs> appreciate that. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it.